Hello, friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. Well, I can't quite see you all, but we'll hear from you throughout this day. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this conversation, which will give you a chance to ask questions to a leading thought leader in the space of GPT AI, which I know that we're all very eager to learn more about as this next sort of hour session or so goes on. Now, I wanted to touch on a topic just before we kick things off. Why are we talking about this topic? The title, which hopefully was a bit of clickbait, got you excited to join us, GPT-5 and beyond. You know, what does that mean? Tools, trends, predictions on the future job market. What impact will that have? Questions that will be answered today, I hope. Also, make sure that you see that question tab there. You have a chance to ask questions yourself throughout this session and towards the end in 25 minutes or so. I would love to hear from all of you. Ask your questions. Use the thought leader we have here today. What is, uh, uh, take advantage. Also, take advantage of the time we have on this platform. So you'll also see the chat function. Feel free to let us know where you're watching this from. Let us know which company you work for, what your role is. Are you positive? Are you nervous towards AI and its impact in the future workforce? Let us know. This is the platform to do so. Thanks to Jarma for putting this together. This has actually come about quite organically. So I had the founder, Nur Al Hassan, on my podcast with Ernest and Young, Better Heroes, a couple of months ago. Maybe you've listened to the episode. And we touched on the topic of AI's role in the language service industry. Noor had some outstanding things to say, and she said, Matt, we have to get you on and bring in a big hitter in the world of AI to educate our audience, to talk to us, or make this knowledge broader and widespread. So thank you to Jama for putting this together. Uh, due to the fact that they are training these LLMs. Now, today is going to be a baptism of acronyms that we're all going to have to learn as we develop in the AI world. LLMs are large language models. Uh, Tajama, for example, build them for clients. And AMTs, Arabic Machine Translation, uh, translation services that exist already. So I'm excited to bring on the guest for today. My name is Matt C. Smith. I'm a broadcaster, author, and I talk about these topics with some exciting individuals and hopefully all of you later. So don't forget to write your questions in there. So... For the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to have a chat with the amazing gentleman that you can see and has been patiently waiting while I've made this intro. Uh, intro. Mortiza, good to see you. Um, Mortiza is an AI researcher, university lecturer, PhD from Stanford in the US, entrepreneur with specializations in deep learning models. Uh, he'll explain what those are a little bit later. Uh, he's been part of many startups that have been acquired by Google, including Lyft, which even IPO'd. But most relevant for this conversation today, and kudos for Tajama bringing him into the picture here, is being a former tech lead and manager at Google DeepMind uh, in their Mountain View offices. Uh, he worked on LMM, uh, LLM uh, large language models uh, during his time with DeepMind. For your knowledge, DeepMind is an interesting organization. Uh, it was a startup, now it's part of Google, and it gained worldwide fame in 2016 or so for programming the first AI to defeat the world champion at Go. You probably remember those days, Mortiza. Maybe you've got some stories you could share as well, which is considered to be the most complicated game there is and has infinitely more moves and possibilities uh, than chess. So that AI model is now, after the acquisition by Google, the backbone of Google's AI and GPT services. But today I wanted to talk about GPT and specifically GPT-5. So to kick things off, um, Mortiza, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, Mortiza, Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, exactly. I know we've got quite a, quite a large number of um, wonderful people. Thank you again for joining us. Um, Marhaban, I believe, is welcome, uh, if I said that correct. Obviously, an example of poor language services in me. But uh, Mortiza, GPT-5 is, we have this in the title of today, uh, GPT-1234, I know that right now uh, on OpenAI's chat GPT function, it's roughly version four. Are these versions, just to set the stage, to allow us to set ourselves up for this conversation, are these different versions 
uh, similar or likened to Apple iPhone releases, you know, the 10, the 11, the 12, I think we're on the 14 Pro now. Um, what are the different differentiations between versions four, I believe we're in right now and five that is coming? Yeah, thanks again for having me. I think that's an amazing question. Uh, we, uh, we were thinking that a, the, the likes of GPT, like P4 or 5, would be similar to iPhone's uh, releases. But uh, in reality, what happened is that these models, each year, they're, they're like uh, iPhone versus the dumb phones that we had before the flip phones, right? <laughs> So it's not like a, a camera that's 10% better. It's like having a camera that you can actually use to take pictures versus a camera that was no one even noticed that it existed in all in those old uh, old day uh, dumb phones. And uh, it's been it's been quite an interesting uh, progression, right? Uh, GPT is the most famous one, but there are a lot of other things happening at the same time. But uh, the improvement that we have seen. Uh, is way beyond just a, a, a marginal uh, improvement from one version to the other. Mm. So we talk about leapfrog growth. And I remember that terminology was being used when uh, I'm from uh, South Africa, for example, and the continent of Africa was having its mobile phone um, revolution, and they weren't going. They were going from you know Nokia 3310s. We some of us may remember millennials in the in the chat right now. Um, our friends watching to the iPhones or to smartphones, low cost smartphones, for example, exponential growth, right? Versus us going through incremental growth. Um, I'm curious about the differences between these versions. And I think many of our uh, friends watching this would be as well. What is the real difference between chat GPT-4 and to, f to 5, the next phase we're moving towards? Um, what are the real functions and features we'll feel that will be different? Yeah, unfortunately, that question is a bit more difficult to answer today than, let's say, uh, two years ago, because the community used to be very open and they used to publish everything about these models and the breakthroughs that went into them. Um, once the immense uh, scale of the economic impact and societal impact uh, appeared, it has become a lot more secretive. So we don't truly know even what's going on in GPT-4 or in the Google version of it or other companies. But we have guesses and there are leaks. Um, so one interesting point is that the majority of the improvement from these models in the past few years has come from scaling. So meaning that these models, when they become bigger, uh, they show significant improvement in their performance. And just to take GPT as an example, GPT-3 uh, is at about 175 billion parameters, and this is a scale, this is the measure of their size. GPT-2 was, I think is about uh, 1.5 billion. So mm -hmm. went from, uh, went from 1.5 billion to almost 100 times bigger, one, 175 billion parameters. And GPT-3 is estimated as 1.8 trillion parameters. So again, about 10 times bigger. And the scale has surprised us a lot, right? So when we look at the performance, let's say if you draw a, a, a graph and on the y-axis you have the performance and the x-axis you have the, the scale, uh, log, log, log. Uh, you draw this and it's, it seems that as we make these models bigger and bigger, they improve in their in terms of their performance. There have been other uh, improvement as well, um, but the biggest gain always came from a scale. Now in GPT five, that's a, or or the the competitors. That's another question. What what we are gonna see uh, is is there gonna be a breakthrough in terms of innovation and technology, or would it be mostly a scale? Now, in terms of a scale, uh, it's, it's another surprise, right? So the, the like of GPT-4, if we, were think, if we were to think about them uh, like a few years back, it would look impossible to even go beyond it because every, every step, every generation, it becomes like 10 to 100 times bigger. It's not like 10% better or, or two, two times bigger. 
So it goes really large. And it was unthinkable to think beyond a GPT-4 scale. But our economy has shown immense adaptability. Um, so I was just uh, researching on hardware uh, a few days back. And it seems like NVIDIA is estimating to build about 1 million high-end GPUs, like these data center GPUs that are used for these models. And it was unthinkable of these numbers were even just a few years back. Uh, so the scale, uh, we thought it will stop, but the scale will continue. Mm. Now, there could be a lot of other innovation, and that's another part of the adaptability of the technology and the economy. We have developed a lot of tools that make working and training and researching uh, with these models a lot easier. Right? So that's another uh, factor that will go in and hopefully will allow us to keep improving these models at this uh, astonishing rate. Mm. And the other thing is talents, right? A lot of people have realized the potential and seen the, uh, the vision of these models and what they can do. And so many smart people have started learning about them and trying them and experimenting with them. And many of these companies have started hiring them or universities or research houses started hiring them. So I'm very bullish. I think, uh, I think uh, the like of GPT-5 would be even more surprisingly amazing. Uh, we managed to push aside a lot of the obstacles, like the hardware, the talents, the tools. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be exactly, exactly. So for example, for GPT-4, mm -hmm. uh, the rumors has it that Microsoft have to has to reallocate a lot of its hardware from other teams working on other projects to be able to help OpenAI train it, right? But uh, with 1 million GPUs coming online just uh, in the next 12 months, right? right uh, we'll have a lot more uh, compute power to, to experiment with this. And mm -hmm. there will be a lot of other firms and other players who will work on this. And I think uh, we have seen that creativity in a, in a more democratized way will always surprise us positively. Moore's law squared, it sounds like, uh, the rate at which we change doubling every single year. It's exponentially growing. And actually, that's a really interesting point you mentioned there, Mortiza. For everyone else and our friends watching this, throw a question at Mortiza as we speak, because I think you might get that answered in this. How can we be prepared? What should we focus on in different various aspects of our organization to include and integrate these types of technologies. Now, Mortiz, you mentioned how, you know, only so many years ago, we couldn't have ever predicted or imagined where this technology would have gone. And I know we promised everyone predictions. So I'm curious, before I ask for predictions uh, of the future going forward for our industry, for the MENA region, uh, for language service businesses, uh, and just businesses in general, if we went back in time five years, 10 years, 15 years ago, you've been working in this field uh, for that long and, and longer in the organizations that are very much at sort of the you know grassroots development of these technologies. Would your predictions 15, 10, five years ago, are they accurate? Uh, are we living in the world you expected us to live in now with this technology? Actually, yeah. So about, uh, let's say, four or five years ago. Uh, DeepMind, as you said, is, was a startup, uh, and they started uh, almost 10, 10, 10 years ago. Uh, so five years ago, uh, we were talking at DeepMind about our vision for what we call AGI, so Artificial General Intelligence. So essentially a computer model that can do many of the tasks at or better than human level, right? that requires some form of intelligence. And at DeepMind, we were thinking that even three, four years ago, okay, we are maybe about a decade uh, be behind reaching there. And most people, even experts in the field were saying that, oh, this is daydreaming, right? Maybe in 15 years, maybe in 100 years, we'll get there. And But uh, many people on DeepMind, the leadership, they had the vision and they were saying that, no, we'll get there. And we got surprised, right? We got, we got uh, caught off guard because we are not there yet. Uh, 
but uh, now people are saying, oh, maybe in three, four years, and a lot of uh, the things that these models can do are amazing, right? Uh, they can take a, a, a MCAT exam and perform very well. No mm -hmm. one thought they would be able to do that uh, today. So no, we were surprised, even though we were one of the most optimistic people uh, about them, we were uh, completely caught off guard with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think almost we should ask the models themselves what their predictions of their futures would be. Maybe that would be more accurate and sort of feed into the loop, right? The feedback loop. But that's the fascinating thing with these these types of technologies and that we keep getting surprised. However, it is a human input and effort that actually results in the outcome that we look for. Um, and in terms of this technology's impact on jobs and careers, I think that's a key question I want to know about. Soon there'll be a, a deep fake of my face, or I think we have that already, right tonality, and I could conduct this interview, um, no problem, remotely on a beach maybe, and my digital twin will do that for me. Uh, we've already seen what the current version of GPT-4 uh, GPT uh, has done in the, I mean, the key example is, is, is the Writers Guild uh, in America, striking. It's a strike that started uh, the 2nd of May this year. Um, 12,000 screenwriters and screenplay writers went on strike to protest against the use of GPT services in their roles, day-to-day -day function, and actually trying to lobby to organize and, org and, and create a system where this could be used only to help and support functions in this area. Um, so we're already seeing the world move in a direction of protesting against GPT-4, now GPT-5 coming. Where do you see that impact play in, in jobs and careers? Yeah, so actually this is a, a very tough question to answer. And one of the best studies that have been done uh, on this is actually from OpenAI again. So they did a study on the impact of GPT on, on jobs and their findings were quite surprising and amazing. They, they thought that 80% of jobs, so pretty much the majority of jobs, will be impacted at least 10% or more. Mm. Right? So 10% of their current tasks will be impacted or replaced or improved. On the other end, 20% of jobs will have at least half of their tasks impacted, removed, or automated. Right? So the scale of the impact would be huge. Mm. Now, beyond the scale, the diversity and the quality is also interesting. Uh, it's, it seems that more higher paying jobs are actually more at risk of being automated or replaced or renovated, to say it. For example, software. That's using. Exactly. I like that. Shuffle the organization. We're re-innovating the roles and the organizational structure. Maybe some of you watching this could take that one. <laughs> exactly, right? For example, one case is the software development, right? Mm. We, are, we are at the core, we are software developers. We build these computer programs and we thought we will be at the end of the queue, right? So we will be, okay, what we are doing is really complicated. We really need to learn this. We are very smart people, right? We spent years at the school and then years at work trying to learn these things. And now we see that we are very, uh, pretty much at the very beginning of the queue, a lot of the models right now are appearing uh, where they can write amazing code, right? And uh, a friend of mine, uh, just a few weeks back, he, he never developed software and he just told me that uh, using GPT-4, he wrote an app for Android and iPhone. Mm. And he was saying, I did it in like two weeks. <sighs> and uh, that was just the waking call, wake up call for me. It's like, uh, you don't really need these, all these years of studying. And um, the other thing that I want to emphasize is what is often ignored. And that's the second order effect, right? If, for example, these models make developing software a lot easier and faster and more, more universal, right? Then people can develop softwares that those softwares will replace jobs mm. or create new jobs, right? So the model itself directly may not replace jobs or create new jobs, but the model will help software being developed that can impact jobs or, or tasks. Or the model may help develop new ways of treatments or mm. new ways of uh, uh, 
building things or new ways of developing robots, right? So the model themselves will not do the work, but they will accelerate the development of other fields that in in then in return they, those development will impact the jobs and i think that that effect in my opinion could be even 10 times bigger than the immediate effect of uh, of these models mm. i think the key point there and what is as you say is is the sort of the positive spin on all of this being that we adapt human beings adapt these models these technologies are to be utilized to our benefit and they are meant to redefine and, as you said, reimagine, reshape, reinnovate the way we work, the ways of working. And I know Tajama do this with their AI translation services. And, and actually, maybe that's a nice bridge to talk about the MENA region and to talk a little bit more about things that are a little bit closer to home. Because, um, you know, being that uh, Tajama obviously are, are a language service company, right? The said webinar is hosted and put on by them. Um, your 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 thoughts around uh, language models, right? These large language models. I, I seeded this at the beginning of the conversation. The acronyms, the LLMs. Surely, the most affected industries uh, would be those that are closely related to anything to do with language translation. Uh, I know Tajama are working on their um, Arabic and machine translation uh, systems and services as well. But are those the most fundamentally affected with these new translation services? And how do we utilize them to our benefits? Yeah, exactly. I think you raised a really important point, and that's the adaptability of our society and our economy. Uh, it's it's amazing how fast we can adapt and reorganize ourselves. And to be honest, if we take a step back and even be a little bit philosophical, there are a lot of people are, are raising concern about the threat of AI for our society. And uh, very honestly, I'm one of the ones that are toward the more pessimistic camp. Uh, I think there's a real challenge, at least, for us uh, ahead. But uh, even if there is a real challenge and there's a big danger, we are, as, as humans, we are probably at the one of the most exciting part of history, right? If we were living a thousand years ago uh, or a thousand years later, I'm not sure if the if if the if life would have been as exciting, mm. so that's at the very philosophical level. But going coming back to the ground, like uh, on the ground, uh, language services, as you said, is 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 about language, mm. and uh, these large language models are also about models of language, so they will be significantly impacted. Uh, in the short term, I I think it would really be positive. Uh, for them in a sense that they there would be a lot more that we can do both in terms of quantity quality and diversity right so if if uh, if a language service company right now can translate x amount of documents they will be able to translate 10x in in just a few short years probably because of the automation and these these models and it would be very similar to what we uh, what we are right now doing meaning that even 10 15 years ago it would have been unimaginable that mm. uh, we will sit on different part of the world and can talk to each other so easily right and um, i think in the longer term medium term languages as a barrier will just disappear from our mind mm. right similar to distances that to, to, to a great extent disappeared, right? We don't care about where our audience is or where each of us sitting. Uh, languages as barriers will disappear. We won't even be thinking about them, right? Or you speak English, I speak another language. Uh, we won't even be thinking about them. So for longer term, I think these kind of uh, companies uh, or entities, they have to really rethink and, and innovate Mm. And I think uh, while the old ways of things, doing things will probably disappear, there will be many, many new ways that uh, people can innovate and create. Mm. Mordeza, thanks for sort of rounding that into a positive spin, because you mentioned your uh, admitted pessimism in, in this space. <laughs> However, I wanted, to, I wanted to, you know, just give everyone a chance. We've got some great questions that come in. Thank you so much. Uh, Hend, Mohammed, 
Uh, some, uh, lots of nice questions. I'll come to you in just a second. But first, uh, this is off topic, off script, Mortiza. Wouldn't be a fun webinar if I didn't throw a curveball at you. We haven't pre-agreed. But I did just wanted to take your piece of advice for our friends watching this, um, wherever they are, whoever they are, their roles in their organizations or, or if they are leading those organizations. Um, just a personal message to everyone. What would you do if you were me, for example, right now, you know, relatively uh, nat uh, non-native when it comes to utilizing these technologies in my day to day? What are the baby steps I need to take to humanize or um, de-risk this world to get onto the bandwagon so that I'm riding the wave of exponential growth as we get to five and six GPT, et cetera, so that I can make sure I future proof myself for my job, for my market, for my career? That's a very good point. And I actually have a positive opinion about that. I feel like this <laughs> wave of exponential growth that comes in these uh, language models and AI in general, right? For the like of me, who, let's say, an expert in the field, uh, we, have a, we have clear challenges, uh, but um, there are a lot, also a lot of uh, hurdles, a lot of competition, and so on. For everyone else, I think this comes as a, an amazing uh, blessing and positive development. If you think about it, right? For example, I don't know how to write well, or I don't know how to produce a great podcast, right? I know how to build great uh, AI models, but that doesn't help me with this exponential growth to become a great podcaster. But for you, you know how to build a great post podcast, and then these tools come and you don't need a lot of expertise to use them, right? Uh, in a way, uh, it's, 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 there's a famous quote that says computers are the biggest tyrant because they refuse to speak any language but theirs, right? Mm. And that was true up to a few years ago. If, up to a few years ago, if you wanted to use the power of these computers, you have to know how to speak their language, right? But they just decided to speak our languages, right? Now you can talk to them, right? And you have your expertise and your understanding of humans, humanity and humans and your audience and what they care about and how they uh, enjoy or benefit from your podcast. And at the same time, these models are at your service. Mm. So in a way, you are in a better position than even me in utilizing and innovating using this new found power at your hand and which, which is a power that's easily available and that's something that i'm also very happy about these models could have ended up being very restricted right mm. this technology could be it it could have turned out in a way that it's only a few have access to it, right? Mm. And it would be very expensive or very restricted. But now it's like open to almost everyone at relatively cheap price, right? So it's an amazing opportunity for people outside the field, right? Who have some core uh, expertise, understanding, knowledge, uh, connection, resources, which now suddenly they have access to these amazing models in their own language without needing to learn anything, uh, without needing to go through many restrictions and at a very low price. I think that's well said. The democratization of technology, you know, the internet, you know, what, 30 years ago now, uh, we've seen that incremental growth. And now we're at a, a point where now access to all linguistic irrelevant as you said, right? And then that's why the importance of these language models uh, come into play, right? When we start to be able to cross-border communicate, like you've said, cross-border uh, translate uh, information, uh, documents, etc. Many of our friends watching this will probably be in the legal world or in the finance world. And there's documentation that needs to be transferred and translated between different organizations, as well as yourself. M what's the way to put it? Make the tedious tasks less tedious by having an AI automate those functions, allowing you, and in my experience, I've, ex I've spoken to a lot of sort of leaders in the space around the use of this and, and coming down to the actual practical day-to-day -day use of these technologies for you and I, well, maybe not you because you built them, but for me and everyone else watching this, all our friends, um, it's about seeing how they can make your life easier, allow you to do more of the things you like to do more of, 
by reducing the admin, the tedious tasks that we tend to have to come with those enjoyable tasks and things like that. I'll leave it at that because we got some great questions from our friends over here. So let's have a read. I'm, I'm going to pick one at random, Mortiza. Um, So we got lots of questions. Thank you. And feel free to, you can, I see you can post emojis and things. If you're enjoying the, the questions, give us a thumbs up, give us a love, uh, give us a wave, whatever is your favorite emoji. Um, maybe you can post a flag or something in the, in the comments if you can. I love to see the flags of where everyone is. Um, all right, first question, uh, Sheikh Walid. Um, coming from Kuwait. Welcome, my friend. Thank you for joining us. How would be, how would it be? How would be the impact on the world employment? So a, a macro question there. Um, GPT 5s impact on uh, world employment. Yeah, I think if we if we want to really answer that question uh, based on what we know or we can predict well, right? A lot of it is very difficult to predict. But one thing is almost certain is that things will change, right? And I think that's maybe the main lesson that we need to take is that we need to be prepared for change, right? I don't think it will change for the worse. I think it will change for the better. But if we are rigid and we want to do things exactly the same way that we used to do, right? And uh, that would be a problem. But if we are open to change and we embrace change and we embrace innovation, I think there are a lot of opportunities. And the great thing is that these technology can help us change ourselves mm -hmm. as well, right? They can teach us probably easier and more effectively. They can help us improve probably easier and more effectively. So I would say there are a lot of things that we can try to predict, but one thing that is almost certain is that things will change. Mm -hmm. And if, if you embrace the change and innovation and try to be, uh, uh, try to be flexible, Right, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Thanks, Mortiza. Uh, great question as well, Sheikh. Thank you. Uh, and one from uh, Carrington Malin, uh, writing. She writes a newsletter for Middle East AI News. Um, the question is: When Mortiza thinks speech recognition will catch up with generative AI chat? So yeah, the question is: when, when will speech recognition catch up with generative AI chat? Despite the huge growth, voice search and voice commands. The arrival of ChatGPT, Bard, et cetera, has driven a lot of people back to the keyboard. Very nice point. Yeah, that's an amazing point. I think these things will be resolved very quickly, very easily, right? And just uh, to that point, last week, uh, Meta introduced another model called Seamless, which it can, it's an LLM, it can translate and uh, and transcribe voice and generate voice at the same time. So as I said, I think these problems will be resolved and this is one of the exactly exciting things. The same way that you don't think about where we are when we are going to have a webinar like this mm. today, we're not going to think about, oh, am I, do I need to type? Do I need to read or listen or in what language? I think these, these barriers will completely disappear. Thanks, Mortisa. Great question, Carrington. Uh, I think this is a really valuable question as well, coming in from Hend from Dubai. Uh, what are the resources that professionals can use to learn more, to stay up to date and use this technology in their jobs, both in general and in the communication sector? Thanks, Hend. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't have exact recommendation off the top of my head, but I think that is, uh, that is an, a one domain that would be significantly disrupted and that's education, right? So education or uh, be it education at the school and colleges and universities or education on the job, right? Training on the job. Uh, I think there are a lot of companies right now working on these things and uh, there would be many more. So just be open and, and look for, for what uh, is the most effective and efficient tool for you but uh, the, the thing what I can say today is that uh, look for a lot of uh, positive surprises as well. You know, and I'll add something to that, Mortiser, as well. I was at a conference in Amsterdam a couple of months ago. I was hosting The Next Web, and we were on stage speaking to a YouTuber that has utilized uh, various uh, AI tools built off ChatGPT4 uh, to 
basically make his job a lot easier. Um, automated script writing, automated what is trending in video titles and you name it, right? So a very specific use case. However, he did encourage people when they asked him the question, as I did on stage, so, you know, uh, what should we all do? How do we all find the tools to use? He said, ask ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. which was, uh, 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 maybe maybe that's the new Google it, you know? Uh, he simply said, just ask ChatGPT. So I think, you know, great question as well. Uh, thanks for that one. Um, but you could go into OpenAI's ChatGPT and say, hey, what are some of the best AI tools I could use? And it will give you a summary, as I'm sure Google would as well, um, as well as what are the most up-to-date newsletters, news um, uh, email threads I could get, uh, uh, you know, subscribing to. I know there are a stream of podcasts, um, AI for Beginners, for example, that you can tune into, which are globally uh, minded and broadcast. Um, and in the MENA region, for sure. Uh, I mean, Tajama, for example, I believe, you know, do a lot of uh, content. This is the, the birth of hopefully much more in this space in the place of language services as well. Or maybe I've just announced it and they should, following this, <laughs> push them into a corner to do it. Um, but I think, you know, being proactive as well, Mortiza, right? Finding out when and how to use emerging technologies in the space simply by being up to date, following the news in tech crunches, uh, MENA regions as well, I think could be quite valuable. Jumping onto Mohammed Magdi's question, in your opinion, what are the major opportunities and challenges for machine translation in the Arabic speaking world? Nice one. How can machine translation contribute to bridging language barriers and fostering cross-cultural communication? Great question, Mohammed. Yeah, I think that's an amazing question. So uh, Arabic is uh, is an interesting language. I, I don't speak it well. I, I know a little bit of it, but uh, Arabic is one of the most difficult languages actually for machine translation. But we we do have we have seen amazing results from these models, uh, even in languages like Arabic. Arabic is one of the lower resources languages as well the, the content that is on the web and otherwise available is not as much as some other languages but we have seen amazing results in many different uh, products including gpt4 including bard in terms of how they speak the language uh, there are other efforts like uh, as you said tajam as uh, amt that's trying to build on the same thing and improve on the machine translation uh, we, in fact, are working on uh, on something that is related as well. So I think the maybe Arabic would be one of the more difficult ones to crack. But overall, in the medium term, I believe these language barriers will completely disappear. So from a consumer perspective or from a, a user perspective, I think these barriers will all disappear one by one. From a business perspective, I think disappearing that barrier create a lot of business opportunities so there are a lot of companies working on that including Tadum and how mm. uh, i was actually going to sort of post a list of newsletters that i found which i think could be valuable for everyone to learn more about uh, how they can utilize these technologies because there are i mean one thing i would say just for for my benefit and everyone our friends watching too mortiza is you know, this technology is one thing. Um, how do businesses utilize this technology? Because it's open source, it's there to be used. Um, is it almost like, to use a metaphor, the internet was created, it's basically a network of connecting computers, storing information, sharing information, right? Um, the GP, uh, GPT services, these, these technologies, these models, right, are there to be utilized by businesses for their own use cases, correct? Yes. And now that's why we're seeing different businesses take those technologies, create their own algorithms that can translate, can you know create a perfect lip sync voice that is synced to you and built around these things. And and the larger these models get, and we by large we mean uh, large language models, it's more data, right? It's more information, and it's the quality of that information, that data, that really I mean, good in, good out, right? That's the model we're seeing when it comes to Arabic translation as well. I mean, actually, maybe this is a good opportunity. Again, off script, um, what is a non-agreed non question, but I'm gonna ask it because I think it's a fun one. Um, you've Go built ahead. these models with Google and with some of the leading organizations around the world. I know Tajama have a, an AMT, an Arabic machine translation uh, service. 
I mean, I got to ask, how do you think they weigh out versus others who are sort of the leading world, uh, what ones in the world, Arabic, English, you name it. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's an interesting point. Data makes a huge difference mm. today, right? And uh, today is a is an interesting, important qualifier here. So today, these models uh, they need huge amount of data, and one of the biggest improvement that we have seen in the recent uh, years has been the ability to fine tune after seeing a lot of data of various quality, if you have a much smaller data set where you can fine tune these models, meaning a specialized that on this high quality data, it can improve significantly, right? The performance on what you want. And I think the likes of Tajima also benefited from that. They, they have their model trained on very high quality data that they have access to and However, the, the, that is today, right? So today, these models need a lot of data and they really benefit from high quality data because they are like, uh, they are like someone read, sitting in a library and reading a lot of books mm. to learn how to do things, right? To learn, for example, how to play soccer, right? So you can go and sit in a library and read a lot of books on how to play soccer well, or even how to play chess very well. Right? You can go and read a lot of books on how to play chess very well, and then you probably will learn how to play chess well. But once you are out in the wild, in the real world, and you start playing chess, right? the information and the training that you go get from interacting with the real world would be much more valuable. Mm. Right? So now, today, these models are suddenly in the real world, right? And they came out of the library, they did their studying and they came out of the library and they're interacting with the real world and they're interacting with us. And I think that feedback would be much more significant, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that is another point that, the part that I'm very positive and bullish about. I think the improvement that comes next could be even more surprising because they are now learning in the interaction with the real world and with, with us humans, rather than just reading what we produced uh, over the years. Mm. So businesses utilizing these tools, not just being built in data rooms with uh, you know, engineers is actually what we'll see benefit all of us more so, right? You know, getting real data, real information um, from uh, yeah, business contracts, for example, when it comes to translation services and things like that, the more that is used, the better the system gets, right? It's that positive feedback system. Um, final uh, one or two questions here. We've got a great one from uh, Sarah El Charre. Um, Hello, Mortiza. Can ChatGPT be 100% aware of the different dialects and different cultures for the localization industry? In my opinion, it can't as each decade, many words are deleted from a specific language and others added and so on. Interesting question, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, so I think my metaphor of reading in a library versus coming to the real world maybe help with this question as well. Once these models are out in the real world, right, then I think they will not only learn about our different cultures and, and localization and dialects, but they will actually influence it. So that's another interesting thing to look for. Uh, they will influence our culture. They will influence our, uh, our understanding of the world around us. They would influence our thinking. Uh, they will probably even influence the way we see ourselves, right? Uh, I don't want to go into that, but just uh, really quickly, if you think, if we take a step back and look, uh, look toward, to our history, right? We, we are, the culmination of uh, so the, the the life on earth as we call it life mm. i will qualify it as organic life like the organic life on earth has a history about a billion years right so we uh, we and then more complex life maybe 200 million years mm. and we humans uh, or similar ones uh, to us uh, these kind of the epics of uh, of the complexity of this type of life, maybe a few hundred uh, thousand years, right? But uh, I feel like we have been a bit too arrogant 
feeling like, oh, we are the smartest, th smartest thing that can exist and life is this form that we see today, uh, who knows, maybe there would be a form of inorganic life. So they will impact our society, they will impact our culture, they will learn a lot about our culture in, in interaction with us, and they may even uh, change the way we think about ourselves. I think by us using them and being influenced by our culture, they might become part of our culture. Uh, quick final question, because it's a great one. Uh, Ahmed Al-Ramadan, uh, is it 100% safe to use AI in security installations, uh, especially in translation and localization projects? Yeah, I think that's an amazing question. I feel like we will see a bifurcation of, uh, of uh, offerings in the future, in the near future, and we are already seeing it, right? So we will have these huge, generic, very powerful models like GPTs and BARD and mm. Cloud and many others. And they can do a lot of things. But for most of the application and industries, I feel like we will have companies that build this thing, which I like to call a whole product, right? So they will include these models or similar ones, or maybe even through an API to one of these main ones, but they will package it as a whole product that will take into account all the needs of the end user, right? Mm. So if it's security needs, if it's privacy needs, if it's a speed, if it's uh, uh, integration with other things, there will be a lot of offerings where th these models may be a core part of it, but they will have a lot more. So that's another exciting part. I think there would be opportunity for many, many startups uh, to, to, to appear and grow and for many of the more innovative companies to create new offerings that when you look at them, it's not like an LLM. Uh, there are a lot more to it, but uh, it's, it's fundamentally enabled by these, these technologies. Thank you, Mortaza. Thank you for all the fantastic questions. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Give us a, a cheer. Uh, give us an emoji if you can. <laughs> Just uh, thank uh, Mortaza for joining us for this um, really insightful sharing this knowledge, uh, making this information uh, broader, understood, um, breaking down the barriers for all of us to utilize this technology. I've gone and posted a couple of AI newsletters that you can all go and subscribe to that are the sort of the top 20 listed. Um, reach out to us. Um, Tajama talk about these topics on a regular basis. They are very much positioning themselves as the Arabic language AI company. Training LLMs, the acronym I have to fight through every day <laughs> for clients. They're Arabic to machine translation services, building Arabic translation service engines and so much more. So reach out to them if you're interested to learn more, to work with them. Mortaza, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking your time and sharing your incredible experience. And, you know, dare I say a little bit of optimism, actually, towards LLMs and the future of GPT-5. When is it coming? Do we know? I don't know. I don't think many people will know except themselves. But uh, there would be there will be many, many will come. So we'll have a constant trickle of these models showing up. <laughs> so it really is actually like an Apple iPhone release. No one knows. Will it be released? Won't it? What will it be? Won't it be? A lot of similarities there. Mortiza, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you, thank Sharma, you. for bringing us together. Thank you, all of you wonderful friends, for joining us. Um, feel free to drop a link to your websites, your LinkedIn's, however you want to connect in the chat so that later when others want to watch this, they can say, ah, oh, interesting. Who's Hemd? Ah, who? Sunita. Ah, oh, Matt. Use this platform to connect, to reconnect, and to learn more about these technologies. Thanks again, Nur, and your wonderful team uh, for putting us together. Ciao for now. Take care. Shukran. Thanks, everyone.
sure the uh, live will end any moment now. <laughs> well, Mortis, thank you, mate. That was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you very much for hosting this. It was amazing. Uh, it still says we're live and recording, so I'm sure it'll stop in a moment. Great questions, actually.